This videotape is part of the Video Oral History Project of the Colony Public Library of the City of the Colony, Texas. This interview is with Larry Sample of 4708 Brandenburg. Mr. Sample is the mayor of the City of the Colony. This interview is taking place at 5201 South Colony Boulevard, Suite 540 on Thursday, May 16, 1985 at 315 in the afternoon. My name is Susan Cartmill and I am the interviewer for the Colony Public Library Video Oral Project. Mr. Sample, will you please state your name and tell us something about your background, such as where and when you were born, maybe where you grew up, places you lived? Okay. Uh, Larry Sample, and uh, I'm uh, 43 years old. I'm a native Dallasite. I grew up in Oak Cliff. Uh, probably rare in this area that we have a native Dallasite. Graduated from Sunset High School. Uh, attended college at the University of Texas at Arlington, which is at the time was known as Arlington State College. Uh, I have a degree in mathematics with the minors in engineering and physics. So you've always lived here in Dallas? I've always lived in the area. I've lived in Dallas. I've lived in Irving, uh, Carrollton, Addison, and the Colony. Do you have any other specialized training besides your college? Were you ever in the services or anything? No, I never was in the service. I was uh, up during the time when we were having peace. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your family. Are you married? Children? I'm married. Uh, my wife is uh, Christina. Uh, she's a flight attendant for Southwest Airlines. She's uh, Worked for them for I guess 11 years now, almost near the uh, inception of Southwest Airlines. Uh, Valerie is uh, our child. Uh, she's uh, seven years old, attends first grade here in college. Wonderful. Your wife used to do all the traveling instead of you, huh? Well, I used to travel a lot. I'm uh, vice president of data processing for the uh, Texas Credit Union League and mainly do uh, work through uh, the members' insurance companies, one of their affiliates. I've been with them uh, 19 years. Okay. Started when I was a child. <laughs> when you were a child. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what promote, What prompted you to choose the colony as your place to live? Well, not very, a really very positive reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, my wife and I were uh, recently married at the time, and uh, we were living in a townhouse in Carrollton. Mm -hmm. and the man uh, forgot to make the uh, payments on it, who we were renting it from, and uh, so uh, he needed to sell the house, and uh, we needed to find some place to live. And uh, I said, "Well, we'll go out to Colony. They have a lot of rental housing out there, and we'll rent a house." And while we were out here, we decided we just buy one. We liked it. Did you start renting first, and then? No, we just no. We bought a house. Bought we a bought a house, and it was finished, and we moved directly. Uh, into, I guess, the first house we owned well, was here in the colony. I've since bought another house uh, and moved from one side of town to the other. But so how long have you actually lived in the colony? I lived here in June of 80, so uh, we're coming up on five years now. So you moved here in 1980, and at what time did you decide to become involved in political affairs? About seven months after I moved here. Uh, when you first move in here, really, you're, you're more occupied with putting in a yard uh, getting your house in shape, and of course, uh, we were interested in that. And then at the time, uh, there was something that was known as the tax revolt that came around. And I didn't actively participate in it, but uh, they raised the taxes at the time, I believe, 94.7% in one year. I didn't really think that that showed good fiscal management. Uh, uh, certainly, you need to increase things from time to time, but if in my job, I'm used to uh, planning out a budget, uh, planning out growth patterns for years, and uh, it was just my belief that, that that showed probably a weakness in the city government out here that I could contribute to with my background. Well, you're currently the mayor. Did you work up in the ranks to that position, or? Yes, I, yeah, yes, I did. I, the first time I, I ran, I ran in uh, April of 1981. I ran against uh, Freeman Upchurch and Gary Green for place two. Uh, nobody knew who I was. 
Uh, I was a seven-month resident in the colony. And, uh, uh, I basically walked and went door to door. And I basically worked the new section of town that I was in because I didn't feel like we were represented. Uh, I lived in the northeast section of town. and uh, Practically every council member was located in the southwest section. That's before we had the uh, single-member districts. Everybody ran at large back then. So uh, I walked, and I missed the runoff by, uh, I believe, 10 votes. And uh, reflecting back on that being a resident of seven months, uh, uh, it was a lot more significant event than what I thought at the time. I thought I should have won. Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, I was probably lucky to do as well as I did. So Mr. Upchurch was convicted of, uh, of uh, uh, what was it? Uh, rape of a child, and uh, so he had to resign from council. Very surprising to all of us. He seemed like a very level-headed man, but I think those type of things very, very uh, uh, usually surprise you when, when it happens to somebody you know. And so he had to resign. Uh, they threw a special election, and uh, I ran uh, for the place to seat again. Had four opponents, and uh, I did win that election in November. Uh, with that runoff. Great. So I served on council for a year and a half. Before becoming mayor? Before becoming mayor. I really had no aspirations to run for the office of mayor. What prompted you to do it then? Council asked me to. Um, Gene Pollard, who was the mayor then, uh, very suddenly, as we come up on re-election, I guess in the, uh, maybe the 83, April 83 election, moved from the city, bought a house in, uh, out of town. Uh, surprised all of us. I'd already filed for my president for re-election in place too. And uh, council talked about it and council asked me if I'd run. And in general, the council pretty well agreed that we didn't want to run against each other. That we didn't feel like that we worked fairly hard in trying to, to bring some unity to the colony. Uh, I think it's one of the things that didn't happen. Uh, the government was a little, a little too much in turmoil most of the time. And I'm not going to say it in a critical manner because it's a very young government, and that's to be expected. So uh, uh, I said, sure, I'll run. Now, I had to resign my seat in order to run back then. That's in our city charter. That scared me to death. And uh, I ran, uh, won by a good margin, 77% the first time. And then recently, as of uh, last April of 85, I ran for re-election and uh, had the same opponent uh, I had back then, plus one other one, and was re-elected. Did you ever think at the time you were considering originally for your first council that you would ever become mayor of the colony? No, I, I never had the desire to be mayor. Uh, I just wanted to contribute as I could. Uh, I thought uh, an at-large council seat was uh, was fine to do what I wanted to do, and that was to uh, to help the city with its with its financial matter, uh, financial matters, to help the city with its its uh, its budget, and uh, and we did that. We did that. We had a, a started out, and we've had consistently uh, uh, lower and lower uh, tax hikes, and we've kept them in the area between. Uh, I'd say 15 to 3 percent during this period of time. Uh, before that, uh, gosh, they were cutting taxes one year, doubling them the next year. And uh, you know, I don't think people mind a tax increase. I think what they want, though, is something that they can work into their personal budget because it does affect their house payment. So I think you want to go with a moderate increase that's in the same line with what their income is increasing and what the cost of living is long. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the current issues that are significant to the residents of the colony. For starters, let's talk about the background, or maybe you can fill us in on the background of the lawsuit between the city of Frisco and the colony. Okay, I was on council when we first started this. And one of the things that, that Mayor Pollard did, and I'm going to give him a lot of credit for this because I think it's something that's so elementary that you have to work on to have a good, stable government with a future. And that's it. You have to know where you're going. You have to know what your boundaries are going to be. And I don't believe anybody ever thought of that. Uh, here, uh, we were very limited in the land. Uh, 
we knew uh, that, that basically it was uh, it was very iffy that the city would survive if we didn't increase the land mass. We were marching uh, with our land mass to have a good, stable, uh, perpetual government, which I think is what everybody wants out here. Uh, so we, we looked around, and we looked at what Frisco had done back in the early days, there were a lot of boundary agreements and done, and this city was really done dirty. Uh, it's almost like in concert, the cities of Louisville, Frisco, and Hebron, uh, within six months, all moved their boundaries and boxed this city in. And well, we started looking at how do we how do we get out of this? And of course, one option was Wynwood Peninsula, and we won that portion of the Frisco Sioux, which uh, gave us the first outlet this city had ever had on some additional lands. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that will prove valuable in the future. Uh, we looked at the five-foot ETJ strip around the city of the colony, and uh, it just didn't look legal to us. And uh, I still say, according to what I know of the intent of the laws and the annexation laws in the state of Texas, I still don't think it was the intent of them. Now, we may lose because of a technicality, but I don't think any legislature ever thought of five-foot strips of ETJ containing another city by one one-tenth its size, uh, seven miles away as the crow flies. So we uh, uh, crossed over the five foot ETJ and annexed the BB on site. We had a request in from LRSD. And the city of Frisco sued us. There's a common mis misconception we sued the city of Frisco. They sued us. We went to, to court. Uh, we lost in St. Houston's court. We, we really got into the issues of the suit a lot further than we thought we would. Uh, uh, the, we had a previous uh, case with Eastvale, what we call the Eastvale case, in um, which it appeared the colony had taken an opposite position, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a principle of estoppel, uh, which uh, I'm not an attorney, but uh, which you could have said, y'all pleaded this way one time, why are you changing your mind today? And really the answer to that is because we didn't know any better, mm -hmm. and nobody had the time or the inclination or the money to get into something to challenge uh, those things. So uh, the next step was a uh, uh, district court in Fort Worth, uh, Court of Appeals went there and we've also lost that. Our next step, of course, is Texas Supreme Court. And uh, we had the foresight when we first got into this suit to knew that it was a suit that would make law in the state of Texas. There are other cities very interested in this suit. It deals with strip annexations and strip annexations. This is not the only place they've ever taken place in. And uh, uh, it will be a law-making suit. And we knew it would either go to the appellate court or the Texas Supreme Court, which is where it is now. And we paid prepaid. As a matter of fact, the legal fees on the way. We knew that. Well, that that's, we knew regardless. If we were one in district court, Frisco would carry it that far. So we knew it was going to be a long time. Well, it sounds like the city of Colony may get some famous recognition out of all of this. Mm -hmm. What's the current status in the lawsuit? So it's, it's in the process of going through the channel? Yeah, well, the first thing we had to do was to ask the uh, appellate court for a rehearing, and they routinely denied that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to do that before you can appeal it to the Texas uh, Supreme Court. Uh, and we'll do that. Uh, I don't know, you know. The only other thing I guess that could happen out of that is that sometime we work out a settlement to it. And we have had talks of settlement. Uh, but it's, it's uh, what they've offered us so far is just so small, it's not worth taking money. We're, we're, we're in a position on this that a man, uh, that like a man who's put down a dollar bet, they can win a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And you say, I'll take, I'll give you five dollars to take that bet off. You go, well, wait a minute, I can win a million. And so if we win the suit, well, we would end up to be the largest, one of the largest uh, cities in this area. It's interesting. So, do you think we're really going to win suit? I think what we're trying to do is to develop a commercial area for the city. And this is what we lack, and, and uh, this is one of the big issues today. We're, we're all residential. Uh, if we're going to have a good future tax base, we have to develop a commercial tax base in the city. Now, what we've done is the council had several positions in order to do this. One was the Frisco suit to gain us some commercial land. Uh, secondly, we began negotiations for with uh, developers south of 121 in the Hebron area to lure them into the city of the colony. I think we're going to be successful in that. 
and that will give us the commercial tax base that we need. The third option is if that doesn't work, we lose the Frisco suit, we aren't able to bring anything in from the south, that we have been able to get the uh, southern part of the colony that now borders 121 zoned, or at least now we have a request to have that zoned for business park, which means that ultimately people in the city will see high-rise office buildings out there. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Highway 121 is the next LBJ. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with you. <laughs> Having traveled mm -hmm. quite a few times. Are there any other problems with the communities? You mentioned the East Bell Sioux. The East Bell Sioux? You're talking about East Bell itself? East Bell's a problem. <laughs> uh, it's a problem uh, because ultimately if it continues to exist, it'll be a slum in the middle of the city. It'll be a slum in the middle of the colony. Uh, a lot of people have wrestled with well, what do you do with that now. And I guess the reason I say that is because the city of Eastvale is approximately 600 to 800 acres. That's absolutely not enough to support a city. Uh, they can never generate the revenues that they need to upkeep that city. They have a problem with septic tanks in it, they have a problem with the uh, some of the housing that's in it right now. What happens needs to happen to the city of Eastvale is it needs to be redeveloped. Uh, there is currently a move on in Eastvale, and I have contributed to this move also very openly to this annex that or disincorporate that city. I believe it's the best thing for the residents of Eastvale. I believe it's the best thing for the citizens of the colony. What can happen in that is that then large developers will go in buy up the city of Eastvale at very good prices because the land in that area today can be sold uh, anywhere between two, five, six dollars a square foot. And so uh, it's to their benefit to do that. Uh, then we let the developers redevelop it, put the roads in, put the water in, and then bring it into the city of the colony on their request. But I pretty well uh, assure the uh, people in Eastvale who talked about this that I have no desire, and I think it would be a mistake for the city to go out and just unilaterally annex the city of Eastvale should it disincorporate. We don't have the $2 million they need to bring those roads up to standard and to bring a sewer and water system up to standard. And I can't see the people in the city of Common vote the mind issue to keep up Eastvale. It's just not going to happen. So I think the method I've outlined is really the only viable solution for the city of Eastvale uh, today. Uh, because they, I know there's some pride over there and they want to make their city work, but uh, it, it, it can't happen. When we talk about us being a marginal city with over 5,000 acres, and we talk about a city of 500, it's way below the margin. You think maybe if we win the lawsuit, that would help some? Uh, no, no, I don't. Uh, the lawsuit will be interesting. If we get the land to the south, and currently we're negotiating for somewhere uh, in the area of uh, 1,500 to 1,600 acres of, of commercial development by uh, the Crow Billingsley Company uh, to bring that into the city of the colony. Uh, I believe that one move in itself, uh, if we get as much as, I'm going to say, six to 700 acres of that even, uh, is, a, is enough to ensure this city's future forever. That will be the tax base the city needs. It will develop for about five years now, but uh, it ensures the city's future, and that's all we've ever tried to do out here. Uh, the suit with Frisco, if we get the land, does get to be less meaningful, because the, the land in Frisco has a much longer development span. It's up in the area of a 15 to 20 year development span. Down south, we're looking at a 5 to 10 year span, so it's really preferable that we proceed south of the colony for expanding boundaries. Okay. Another problem today, of course, involves the colony access getting to and from the colony. Would you describe the current situation and discuss any help for improvement on 121? Well, the current, the current situation is terrible. Uh, uh, 121 is, is uh, rated by the State Highway Department as the fifth most congested non-freeway highway in Texas. Uh, in particular, the portion that's now between 423 and 544 is uh, on their maps as being grade F or failing as far as traffic patterns go. Uh, what we have done is we do now have the four lanes divided, approved by the State uh, Highway Commission, and they're currently uh, building a bank right away for it. 
uh, we've got our portion of the right of way all donated. We're ready to go. And we've encouraged them through the donation of this right of way to start in the city of the colony, finish up this section between 423 and 544. The freeway is now being studied. That to me is a much longer range plan. I see that happening in somewhere in 10 years. Now, I know there's people that are more optimistic about here but in the area, but I really think that's a lot more realistic. Put the four lanes in. Go for the freeway. I think the chances of the freeway, I talked to Ben Campbell, our state representative, they look very well that we'll get that. But uh, uh, we've got we've got to walk before we run. As far as the traffic situation in general, Crider Road right now, County Road, is unbelievably packed. Uh, that's because people out here are not really, do not want to go east and west. Uh, that's where 121 goes. People get on 121 today, and it's congested because they're trying to get to a north-south artery. And that's the reason the Crider Road, which is a little two-lane county road down the bottom column, is so congested. Uh, part of the 1,500 acres, and this will happen regardless of whether we get any of this land or not, Page Road will be extended. And I believe that that will be done by, uh, let's see, this is 85. Uh, I believe this will be done probably and finished by the end of 1986, or come close in that period, where we will have the page road extended and it will become part of the Plano Parkway. Uh, you'll be able to get on that road from Page and with, I'll say, a year and a half, go all the way uh, to uh, I-44 Midway Road, Dallas Star Toll Road, a uh, very ideal situation, I think, for people in this community. So the, the traffic problems, uh, we've worked a lot of them just through signalization, but we have a very delicate balance out here. I went through Carrollton yesterday. Carrollton's got a worse traffic problem than we did. Okay. <laughs> you think the DART would have helped any? Have we gone ahead? Had the citizens of the colony voted to let the DART come in? I supported the DART. The DART lost. Uh, I supported it for different reasons. I, I'm not sure that the DART program will ever significantly impact the travel patterns in this area. I think what will happen in this area is what is happening today. Uh, the businesses will move to us. They will move to the employees. The employees will not have to move to the business. Uh, the current place I work is located at LBJ Newport Freeway. Uh, it takes me uh, maybe 10-15 minutes to get to Trinity Mill Road and the rest of the other 20 minutes uh, to get into uh, Midway and LBJ. It's terrible. The congestion over there is terrible. And I don't see a whole lot of relief for it in the future. And uh, even my company is looking at this area to relocate. Uh, so I think those things uh, will happen. And, and uh, you'll see the EDS complex uh, come up out here. You'll see uh, the 1,500 acres. And what we have out south be developed in high rises. I believe that will happen over the next five to 10 years. And, and you'll see. Uh, 121 to become LG, LBJ Freeway. Uh, DART, I was for it because I felt like it would stimulate commercial development in the city. Uh, I felt like uh, we had a proposed way of land on there, so a lot of people look at that. It'll, it'll attract business and industry to the city. And, and I'm, I was for DART more for the attraction it would give us in, in moving people back and forth to the colony, than, than, which I think will ultimately be the question, rather than trying to take people to Dallas. Because I think we're going to become the next absent. Well, only time will tell on that. <laughs> we recently had a bond election here in the colony in which all of the issues were passed. Can you describe the results and what does it mean exactly for the colony? The results were overwhelming. Uh, these were the first, uh, I believe, the least issue we had to pass. Passed by two to one vote on up to three to one and four to one. Uh, I think the people of this city finally said, you know, we're going to be a city. These are the first permanent structures, or real, I call the first real structures we're going to have in the city. I was overwhelmed with the way the citizens uh, uh, responded to that. Uh, very, very favorable. And I, I think it says a lot about the spirit of the community, uh, the people that live here. Uh, you, know, you know, the challenge of this community, you know, I think the North Texas Survey says this, is uh, we're a lot different than other communities. We have... Uh, we're missing the two permanent parts of a population that most cities have. Most cities have a very old, established, elitist, rich family that lives in town. We don't have that here. Uh, 
with the city's uh, oldest house in 10 years, you don't have that. Uh, at the same time, uh, we don't have a second very permanent population element in the city, which is the uh, the poor, uh, the downtrodden, uh, that are, they're, they're so economically depressed they can't move. So we don't have either one of those. We're so middle class, it's unbelievable. And I, I think that's, that's more or less a challenge sometimes to the citizens of this community, saying, well, we can make that work. Uh, you know, we always hear people talk about the middle class of America as the backbone. And I think this, this city will show whether that's true or not. I think people are taking more pride in the city, too. As well. Oh, definitely. I, I look around today and I see, I've seen more yard work and people fixing up their houses in, in the past year than I've ever seen in this city. Uh, I think it's because we've been a very transient city and now people are starting to settle in and call this home. It used to be people said, well, we'll go live in the colony for three to five years and then we'll go move someplace else. I, I think that's vanishing. For the first time, we're starting to have housing sales of over, of houses over $100,000 in the city. That's just started within the last year and a half and they're a significant part of it. So that's a very good indication, I think, also. That to me is just house. <laughs> Let's talk about the bonds just a little bit more. Why don't you tell us exactly what the bonds are going to do for the colony. What's in those bonds? Well, uh, a library facility, of course. Uh, a permanent library facility that I think will uh, uh, serve our needs. And, and I heard today, by the way, that uh, we were uh, placed on a list for a library grant. And that's very thrilling news. Uh, but it will uh, establish where that's going to be. Uh, one of the very important things is that we've done, that most of you haven't done, is we have a central site to put all our government facilities right now. We don't have to scatter them out all the time. We've got 17 acres up there dedicated to build municipal facilities. I think that'll handle the, the, the city for a long time in the future. The library will be there. We certainly need to start a library at that point. City Hall is a must. Uh, I know that was, may have been played down in the last election, but we're operating out of a portable building with 67 employees full time. Uh, that can't continue. Uh, what kind of image does that give to us when people from out of town come in. I've, I've had people say, say, where's City Hall? And I said, well, do you know where Fire Station Number 2 is? And I said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, it's right next door. That's City Hall. Yeah. And uh, so it, it starts that. I think that'll be a, a more efficient government out here, that we're getting out of the, of the do-it-yourself government from the colony and getting into a very efficient, I think, uh, efficiently run city government with the right size for that. Uh, the fire station was approved, and we will need another fire station in, in the future. Uh, the swimming pool, I think, will be a very good. We do have a problem with our youth and not have anything to do in the summer, and I think we're committed to, to tackling that problem. Uh, and the swimming pool, uh, I know we've even talked about trying to get it in this summer. Uh, and it is possible to do that, to give kids somewhere, because what we're faced with out here is 88% of the adults leaving here every day to go to work. During the summer, the kids are out of school. What do they do? Uh, we don't have, as you said, public transportation to take them to Carrollton, to Louisville, and those other places. So we need a gathering place here. Uh, I think it'll, it'll help pull that crime rate around. The rec center, same idea on it. Uh, pedestrian crosswalk, I think, will help join this city right now. We have a dividing line, 423 down to the middle of it. <clears throat> and I'd hate to see it become known as the East Colony and West Colony. Uh, I'd just like it to be known as the colony. Uh, we have a junior high that's playing over in that area in the school, and, and the crosswalk will uh, allow the kids to go across there in a safe manner. So the emphasis on the bond issue is youth. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Even though we have a city hall, and I even think the library, I'd say, is emphasis, again, youth in the community. So I think those things will uh, very, very thrilling overnight. Our job now is to make sure they're done and accomplished as quickly as we can, holding the tax rate where we need to hold it. Mm -hmm. Well, the youth, of course, is definitely a major concern for the colony, mm -hmm. but are there any other concerns that you feel are currently significant to the welfare, welfare of the colony? Yes. I think that those are the issues before. One of the biggest things that I've run on day one is rental property in the city. Mm -hmm. It concerned me. It concerned me because I bought a house in a Today Edition in 1980. And when I moved out, there were five homeowners in block of like 40 houses. But we had a problem because of the type of housing we have out here is FHA VA loan. It's very easy to assume, and it's a super tax write off for an investor. Uh, the problem is not in having real houses, making sure that it's kept up. I think we could have 
had seriously deteriorating sections of this town. And the future will bear me out. So whether it's true or not, I think we've made inroads in stopping that. Uh, we had 28% of, of the city for rent. We dropped that to 19.1 through some ordinances. And it's not that I'm any rent problem. It's just that we have a lot more than our share. Uh, the average for a dent count was 11%. The average for Dallas County was 8%. So uh, we were developing a reputation with that that was not the best of reputations, and I believe it had to be turned around. So what we're telling people is, you fine, you have a ring house, you're going to have to keep it up. And if you don't have the capital to keep it up, you better get rid of it and sell it to somebody that does. Uh, either that or sell it to a homeowner. So uh, I felt like that was a very serious uh, situation we had. The tax rates, of course, were very serious, but that's just good man money management and getting some council members that have financial backgrounds elected. Uh, uh, the other issue, of course, is that we have a mud district out here. Uh, I think it served its purpose. Uh, I think we're vast approaching the time where we need to operate like other cities in, in the area with a water department mm -hmm. and not a separate elected board. Uh, the tradition, I think, between the city and the mud has been one of conflict. I don't think it has anything to do with the particular people involved. I think it has to do with you just don't have two governments in one city. It doesn't work. Makes for argument, I'm sure. What do you feel is your most significant contribution to the colony? I think if I'm able to bring in commercial land down south, that would be my most significant contribution to the city. Uh, so, like I said, it ensures the city's future. Now and forever. Uh, I think it defines our boundaries. I think, if anything, uh, during my administration, what we've done is that we have. Planned. And I don't think it was planned before. We tried to say, where are we going and how do we get there? And that's look at the crystal ball a little. Mm -hmm. And make those things happen that need to happen today. It's easy to say we need commercial property in the city of the colony. And I see some people that want to go out and jump in a car and ride down to the nearest office and stop and say, move to the colony, please. Mm -hmm. That won't get it. Uh, it takes a lot of detail work. Uh, it takes things like working on, uh, we passed a uh, business park zoning ordinance, uh, which allows the high rise buildings in this city. I think that's a very significant ordinance. So I guess if I had to look at, at significant things that, that happened uh, while I was mayor of uh, high school, certainly one. We, we never had one until then, and, and we had a lot of negotiations on high school. I'm afraid we weren't going to get it for a long time, but we worked out a deal where we traded some parts on Very significant thing. We were able to get our first. Uh, school board member elected in the colony uh, during this, and even though that's not a, a, a job per se as mayor in the charter, uh, I knew we had to have that. We got the high school property in order to make that thing go smooth. We had to have a colony member on that school board, and we got them, mm -hmm. and it took a lot of work out here to do that. Uh, that, I think the rental uh, ordinance uh, won't be uh, probably down the line, everybody will say, why did you have that? Because they, they weren't here. When the, city, when the problem existed, that that were, were created. Uh, the roads, the uh, okay of 121 on getting that widened, that had to happen. We worked very hard at that. Budget line, bond issue. But uh, I think the overriding thing would be bringing that commercial property in the city and getting that outlay in here. Once we get that outlay, um, yeah, we'll get people moving out here because we're the, we, we're, the, we're the city with the best roads, not the worst. <laughs> okay. You probably have to do some convincing of people there. Are you going to continue to be actively involved in community affairs? Oh, yeah, uh, I will be. Uh, I'll say this uh, when it comes to my day to hang up my hand as mayor of the city, I'm not going to be out there second guessing the present mayor. I get some of that now. Mm -hmm. I don't appreciate it. Uh, I think if uh, uh, the people elect somebody to lead their city, it would be my job to sit back. I would hope I could be the type of ex-mayor in the future uh, that Mayor Pollard was with me. Uh, what an ex-mayor is for is for the current mayor to be able to call up and say, hey, you know, I've got this problem, mm -hmm. and i like to talk to you about it. You've got some experience in that job. How would you handle that? What would you do? And uh, I was able to do that with Mayor Pollard, and he helped me a lot, I think, during my first six months to a year in office. And, I would call and say, Gene, I've got this problem and this and this. And 
What do you think? And, and he would go back, uh, not trying to, to push me in directions, but just to situations in his turn. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of relation I think any ex leader should have with the current one. And so I hope when it comes to my time to step down to go for grace. Does the city have a, some kind of an ordinance or whatever that says you can only be mayor for two times? No. No, we don't. We don't have a, we don't have a limit out here. Uh, I don't know how long I'll run for mayor. Uh, I knew I'd run this time because I think we've got a lot of things to finish, and I believe it's a very critical time. Uh, I believe if if I if I get the land in, if, if we uh, have a commitment on 121 and that road's finished, and we get the bond issues well underway, uh, I will believe that I will establish this city to such a degree <clears throat> that nobody can mess it up, and I'd like to do that. <laughs> I'm sure you can do that. <laughs> you sound pretty positive. What do you think the future holds for the city of the colony? Uh, I think the city of the colony is in the same position the city of Addison was. I think people like to look back at that. That makes sense silly to look people. I've lived in Dallas a long time. And uh, my company bought some land in the city of Addison uh, back uh, 15 years ago. We bought some land on the corner of LBJ and Midway Road, about 25 acres. And uh, we had a, a building down on Ross Avenue at the time. And, and I noticed that uh, at any point time we were looking at the area, and then back then we were saying, well, you know, it looks pretty good. It's sure out in the boonies, though. <laughs> and uh, we're going, well, yeah, but the development's going that way. We ended up selling that land, by the way, for uh, it would be worth almost $100 million today. Uh, if we still had the 25 acres with. But we looked at it and we said, well, there's farmers grains, they're pretty stable. Right? We looked over at Addison and I said, what's Addison? I said, well, that's a, a rural black farming community. And that's what Addison was 15 years ago. A lot of people forget that, is they had a, it was a rural black farming community. And look what it is today. High rises, got to one of the only decreasing tax bases in, in the city. I think we can be better than the city of Aston, though, because the city of Aston does not have enough residential land. It's too commercial. So if we can get a, a, a proportion of about, I think, 25% commercial high rise in the city to 75% residents, I don't think we're going to grow much more residential. You know, we've got Woodland Peninsula to fill up. We've got uh, the rest of Stewart's Creek. Uh, but I, I see the city's population probably getting somewhere between 30,000 to 50,000, depending on the uh, density that it's developed at. And uh, uh, we're wet out here. Mm -hmm. The citizens voted us wet. Addison did the same thing. And uh, it brought in a lot of restaurant traffic. I'm not trying to make this the booze capital of the world, but uh, it, brought in, it brought in a lot of restaurant traffic. And that got them on the road. And once they got on the road, it never stopped. I think the city of the colony can do the same thing. I think we can be the Addison Farmers. Or North Dallas, and that's what I'd like to see. Well, we certainly have the city of Addison to look at and to help yes. make our plans. We look at, we look at, I think we need to look at a combination between the city of Addison and the city of Farmers Branch, where you have, you know, a lot of people don't realize the city of Farmers Branch was a Fox and Jacobs edition. I didn't know that. I went and looked at homes there, and people haven't said, you know, people tell me, I said, oh, we don't have quality homes to be a Farmers Branch or Addison. I went back and say, I'll tell you what, Farmers Branch and Carrollton began as Fox and Jacobs edition. Good enough. We have lots of Jacobs to thank for this. <laughs> Are there any other comments that you'd like to make? No, I think, for the colony or? No, I think we've, we've, uh, we've covered most of it. I think it's, it's an exciting time right now to be in the city, to see the development, to see it in its infancy. Uh, very exciting time. You, you get to, uh, people that, that get to do uh, things now, have an opportunity to do those things, which, which there will be few opportunities in the future to ever have. Uh, um, I know uh, uh, one of the members of the library board uh, you know, was the first librarian. Anne Beckham was the first librarian mm -hmm. of this city. Well, that's an honor. Mm -hmm. That's an honor that, that, that few people ever got to say, well, I was the first librarian of this. Or I was the first member of PNC or I was the first thing. So, no, I think we just need to stay on a stable thing, you know, and that needs to happen because if I survive uh, my term and I go past next January and I don't have any plans right now not to do that, I will be the longest tenured mayor assistant in the history of the city at, at two terms. 
And they, well, it's good and it's bad. Uh, you look at the tenure, of, the mayor's tenure ought to really be somewhere in the area, four to six years. If he's good, if he knows what he's doing, to get across the programs that you want to get across. City government runs remarkably slow. It's not like being in, in private enterprise where you can say, do this, do this, do this, and get it done. There's too many procedures. It's, it's slow and it's frustrating sometimes, but the uh, uh, achievements are worth the effort. The outcomes are well worth it, I'm yes. sure. We'd like to thank you for participating in our project, and I'm sure you'll do an outstanding term as mayor again. Oh, well, I'll know when he takes when somebody looks at this. <laughs> thank you very much. All right.